Towards a Spiritualized Society, Oroville, an Experiment in Prefigurative Utopianism. Doctoral Thesis by Suryamai Ashvini Clarence Smith. Chapter 9. Conclusion. So what's the point of utopia? The point is this, to keep walking. Eduardo Galliano. Asking, we walk. Zapatista slogan. Through an autoethnographic exploration of the uniquely well-established intentional community Oroville, this thesis defines and empirically substantiates a groundbreaking theorization of prefigurative utopian practice with significant contributions for both prefigurative and utopian scholarship and experiments. In the first section of this concluding chapter, I specify how my work advances academic conceptualizations of prefigurative and utopian practice and how this is relevant for their enactment. In the second, I highlight key insights from my ethnographic analysis that I consider to be contextually pertinent for the ongoing project of Oroville. Finally, complementing how undertaking this doctoral research precipitated various forms of engagement with Orville's ideals, detailed in the second methodology chapter of this thesis. In the third section, I share that it has enabled me to recognize how other community members variously engage with these ideals and conclude that recognizing and affirming such practice at a collective level is key to empowering our spiritually prefigurative utopian project. Theoretical Horizons Occupy Prefiguration My work reclaims and builds on the early conceptualization of prefiguration in considering a broader wealth of practices, not only within, but also beyond political contexts, as prefigurative action. To date, the concept of prefiguration has almost exclusively been employed in analyzing the political practice of left social movements. While early scholars considered the socio-cultural practices that were enacted alongside political ones, such as decision-making, to be a part of the prefigurative repertoire, and thus identity, of these movements, in the last decade, the former have been discarded from its analytical purview. Only those practices that were directly and strategically enacting another politics, strictly defined as forms of organizing and decision-making, were considered to be part of the prefigurative exercise. I come back to the question my father asked himself as a protester in the early 1970s. What is the society we are going to build once we win the revolution. Political practice alone is not going to construct an alternative society. Yet the actors of prefigurative politics are driven precisely by the prospect of living in one. By remaining as exclusive as it does today, the conceptualization and ensuing ethnographic focus of scholarship on prefiguration thus does a disservice to its underlying project and potential. I thus invite fellow scholars to occupy prefiguration. Any practice that is enacting attitudes, modes, and relations with the strategic intention of constructing alternative utopian societies warrants the definition, one that will enable kindred practices to be collectivized and empowered as a result. Institutionalizing prefigurative practice. In examining prefigurative utopian practice in the context of Oroville, a uniquely well-established intentional community, significant points of consideration pertaining to the role of institutionalization for the perpetuation of alternative constructions of society emerge. Whilst the anarchist ethos and praxis that underlies many alternative movements and practices, prefigurative politics in particular, often explicitly resists trajectories of institutionalization, 
Orwell's experience with the latter responds to important critiques and concerns regarding the capacity of radical experiments to establish and maintain viable societal alternatives. Proponents of such experiments, scholars and actors including Orwellians, myself, many of whom share anarchist sensibilities and who thus may find Orwell's institutionalization to be problematic, must therefore give this aspect of Orwell's evolution due theoretical consideration. In light of my research, I argue that the institutionalization of Orwell does not necessarily have to counteract its prefigurative nature. Rather, it compels us to consider the revolutionary notion that establishing institutions may be part of a stage in the process of prefiguring an alternative society that ensures their perpetuation, when this institutionalization retains a prefigurative character, when its organization facilitates the social reproduction of desired alternative social relation, and when it remains experimental and therefore flexible and responsive to evolution. In Orville, such institutionalization may even be prefigurative of an alternative to the state. Sri Aurobindo has said, quote, the state is bound to act crudely. It is incapable of that free, harmonious, varied action which is proper to organic groups. In prefiguring the state, while Davina Cooper recognizes that, quote, for many scholars, radical change cannot emerge from or within the state, but only from outside, and it is the presence or potential for an outside which is key, she argues that there is room, alongside left state critiques, for a, quote, prefigurative conceptualization of the state that, quote, reimagines what statehood could mean rejects a sharp distinction between states and other political governance formations. Among the three features of a prefigurative state she proposes is embeddedness in everyday relations, in which the roles of administrators and beneficiaries overlap and are entangled, enabling, quote, a multiplicity of informal junctures and networks, through which policies may be, quote, advanced, transformed, gutted, enabled, and thwarted through a rhizomatic stretching out, activating, and incorporating of members of a policy and their projects in a constantly evolving governmental form. I recognize Orville's mode of governance within these descriptions. My ethnographic research reveals that policies are proposed, criticized, protested, ignored, reworked, and amended by overlapping groupings of community members virtually continuously. Importantly, this embedded nature remains unchallenged by the current shift in political organization in Oroville, uncovered in my analysis, from a direct democratic towards something more akin to a representative democratic model. The latter observation is an important one for consideration of what modes of governance are able to embody features of a prefigurative state. My theorization of the subjectively objective nature of Orville's current administrative praxis also contributes to Cooper's important exploratory conceptualization of a prefigurative state. Policies abound in the community's collective organization at present, pointing to a Weberian process of bureaucratization, the trappings of which Orville is not immune to, notably its formulaic nature. This limits the free, various, and therefore arguably prefigurative praxis of governance described by Sri Aurobindo, whether in the context of a residence assembly gathering, such as a selection process, or the decision-making of an administrative group. Yet, in the subjectively objective articulation of this bureaucratization enacted in Orville, critical, flexible, and responsive to subjective perceptions lays prefigurative potential for an alternative practice of, and or to, state administration. 
prefiguring utopianism, spiritualizing utopianism. In this thesis, I use the concept of prefiguration as an analytical lens through which the nature of Orville's utopian praxis is analyzed, assessing whether and how its practices attempt to strategically embody and in so doing propel an evolution towards the community's ideals. I found that the lens of prefiguration was particularly adapted to understanding utopian practice in the context of Orville, because the latter articulates with a prefigurative conceptualization and not a fixed vision of the future, through experimental praxis. Davina Cooper highlights that prefigurative conceptualization, just like prefigurative practice, must be both reflexive and provisional. Each are key to the ongoing enactment of an evolutionary praxis of utopianism, particularly in an established alternative society such as Orville, because they enable such praxis to be engaged in a learning process, what the Orville Charter describes as unending education. This process of learning or education is not only related to concrete utopian practice, what works or doesn't work in terms of the practical application of utopian ideals, but as both the utopian philosopher Ernst Bloch and utopian social theorist Ruth Levitas have highlighted, to the very nature of utopianism itself. Bloch described it as learning hope, Levitas as the education of desire for a better way of life, the mother as a thirst for progress. For the mother, both the thirst and the progress were of a spiritual nature, which Ruth Levitas suggests is central to utopianism itself. Quote, If utopia is understood as the expression of the desire for a better way of being, then it is perhaps a sometimes secularized version of the spiritual quest. Among the key contributions of this thesis is an ethnographic account of how a spiritual quest underlies, strategically articulates, and sustains a prefigurative utopian project. Oroville is an intentional community that is not conceptually or practically dissociated from the challenges and potentialities of the conditions in which it is embedded, but predicates itself on the incorporation of these challenges and their transformation through spiritualization, wherein lies coexisting latent potential. Contextually Grounded Hopes This autoethnographic account offers insights into how Orvillians have articulated with and sought to embed Orville's ideals into the development of the community in the face of various limitations over its considerable 50-year history. This is a process that many newer members of the community, even ones such as myself who were born and raised within it, are largely unaware of. When I rejoined Orville as an adult member and became aware of how challenging it was to engage in, sustain, and carry forward this utopian community project, I had a new and incredulous appreciation for all those who had participated in fostering the, in my case, utopian environment of my childhood. In familiarizing others with this process, I hope this thesis will increase appreciation for its exacting nature, both in terms of complexity and dedication as well as embolden fellow community members to persevere in the face of the challenges that they will encounter. I also believe that we would be enriched by complementary research into how individual Orvillians in various demographic groupings relate to and embody our ideals, beyond our own prevalent focus on Orville's pioneers and the growing interest in generations raised in Orville. In an increasingly bureaucratized and institutionalized context, this thesis makes a case for continued experimentation. In light of the successful accounts of how small-scale experiments progressed to becoming embedded into Orville's communal organization and the significant hurdles that were overcome 
for such embeddedness to be achieved, I hope that Oravillians, especially those that are newer to the community or came of age in this phase of formalization, will be struck by the potential of such experimentation, even in their private, individual spheres, for prefiguring change in the public, collective sphere of Orvillian society and galvanized to sustain this process. The power to shape and transform our society lies in such engagement. In transferring such expectations and responsibility onto our working groups, we both disempower our polity and unfairly burden our public servants. We must understand that the role of our current administrative apparatus is primarily to meet the organizational needs of a community our size and growing. Some of the working groups I observed were engaging with Orville's ideals while doing so, enacting a subjectively objective administrative practice which itself seeks to prefigure the principles of a subjectivized society. Such practice would benefit from being reflected in communications with the community and centered in our overarching discourse on administration, so that the prefigurative potential it contains can be appraised, upheld, and advanced. In the face of increased formalization, encouraging an anarchic and subjective utopian treatment of the artifacts of this process, such as policies, is critical to an ongoing, spiritually prefigurative political praxis. Calling our policies guidelines is not going to achieve this. The dissatisfaction with and disengagement from our current participatory exercise of political organization and practice may, as I have suggested in this thesis, for some point to a failing of the mode. However, instead of reverting towards representative forms and tools of democracy, it would behoove us for the sake of the project of horizontal organizing, which has been taken up by many other collectives, to first try addressing that which currently cripples our collective decision-making forums. This could take the form of experimenting with and empowering various scales and formats of engagement, developing protocols of personal and interpersonal conduct, and introducing measures of accountability for process duration and outcomes. Personal reformulations. Many of the experiences of undertaking field research for this thesis, as well as the specific insights and conclusions it yields, have defied my own expectations. I was not sure whether, let alone how much, our ideals were being articulated and embodied in our community praxis. I was not cognizant of the fact that the figures and works of the mother and Sri Aurobindo continued to be so influential in much deeper ways than the wielding of statements for the legitimation of personal views. I did not think I would end up questioning the very merit of horizontal forms of political organizing, suggesting that bureaucracy and institutionalization might have prefigurative potential, or advancing the notion of a government-enabled anarchy. Being open to such stance-defying outcomes required its own form of subjective objectivity, a willingness to reformulate my own subjective, previously unquestioned preconceptions through a sincere and rigorous research process. The latter deepened existing relationships, understandings of and engagement in areas of community life familiar to me, and exposed me to spheres and individuals in and with which I had little or no prior connection. This decentered and unsettled, sometimes uncomfortably, my personal understandings of what constituted articulating our ideals. As a researcher, I could not allow myself to be identified with these. While I experienced what I perceived to be various levels of disengagement from such a process, which was disappointing, and in some cases even felt like a betrayal of our collective commitment. I also gained a much more complex and multifaceted understanding of the multiplicity of ways in which we Oravillians attempt to prefigure these ideals in our community. 
this reflexive and evolving process of reformulating my own perspectives and understandings by occupying Orville and others's has allowed me to identify such articulations where I failed to before, simply because they were so foreign to me. I am certain that many oversights remain, and I look forward to continuing to deepen my experience of and within Orville in this regard. I am also certain that while it is important to be aware of and to address our shortcomings, recognizing and affirming the ways in which we do enact and embody Orville's ideals is what will empower our individual and collective capacity too. Quote, Take the psychic attitude, follow the straight sunlit path, with the divine openly or secretly upbearing you. If secretly, he will yet show himself in good time. Do not insist on the hard, hampered, roundabout, and difficult journey. Sri Aurobindo